But I wanted to share with you some of the some of the many, many clubs of Toledo that had illegal gambling. Uh, because of the time constraint, I've left out some of the smaller clubs, and I'm just going to deal with the, the main operations and the main people. Uh, the way I'm doing the presentation is I'm going to start off with the various clubs. I'll give you information about it, and then towards the end, I'm going to deal with the faces. Uh, the name of the book is Illegal Gambling Clubs of Toledo, The Chips, The Dice, The Places, and Faces. And I'll run through the topic in that general order. You're welcome to ask questions at any time. Don't, don't feel it's interrupting. I enjoy it as long as we don't get too far off topic, and I'll try to keep us back on, on the topic. But you, you're welcome to ask questions. Make sure my mouse is working. There we go. Okay, starting from about the turn of the century, Toledo was so famous that even out in Quebec, they're dealing with the arrests of gamblers and the raids on the various gambling clubs. Why is it going back? There we go. Headline news in 1904. Right across the headline. I love the picture of the woman here with the uh, yeah. fancy hat. If you look carefully, you can see this headline of the Toledo News feed, Gamblers Told to Close the Rooms. In the, the clubs in Toledo, uh, in the early part of the century was not as we would call mob room. There really wasn't any gangsters and mob mentality until Prohibition. At that time, the gamblers all worked and had their own clubs, and the world was a wonderful place, and they lived in harmony. They would visit each other's clubs, they would share clientele, uh, they would share information. Uh, they, they worked really as one cohesive unit, even though they were all separate. The uh, 513 Club, uh, for those of you that know some of the illegal gambling clubs of various cities, they had to come up with something that they were known by. And typically they were known by a street address. So the 513 Club was at 513 Jefferson. They had everything from craps, blackjack, faro, poker, slot machines, and they ran for about 15 years from the early 20s to 1935. The left side picture here is what it looks like today. Wow. It's called the bar and the matchbook. In researching illegal clubs, matchbooks are a very valuable source of information for addresses and sometimes they move proprietors. Uh, you wouldn't think that it'd be so important, but as a researcher, Finding matchbooks and other memorabilia is very important. Opening ads in the newspaper, uh, very, very valuable. The Academy Club, and well, we're also gonna show dice and chips from the various clubs. Many of the clubs only had uh, either silver dollars uh, or coins that were used for, uh, for the game. <coughs> the Academy Club, 21 gaming tables, no little operation. Uh, the names that you see here, Bassett, Jacobs, the Al Jacobs uh, is actually a very famous family of Jacobs. Uh, some of you may know the brother whose name is Danny Thomas. His real name was Jacobs. The, uh, let me just slip another piece of information. You'll see uh, on, on the slides a lot of times it's listed the Purple Gang slash River Gang. The Purple Gang was really never in Toledo. Uh, the mobsters, uh, Licavoli, the Licavoli Gang, stated that let everybody know we're the Purple Gang as an intimidation factor. They were into a lot of extortion, uh, forced partnerships, and the way to get respect was by calling themselves the Purple Gang. The true Purple Gang were out of Detroit. 
they just assumed the identity and put the word out there. The newspapers never referred to them as the Purple Gang. Articles, any information to police, nobody referred to them as the Purple Gang. It was the store owners, the club owners, that all said the Purple Gang. They were truly the River Gang out of Detroit. They originated in, in uh, St. Louis, and uh, originally they were called Egan's Rats. <coughs> Egan's Rats, E-G-A-N. Uh, they were out of uh, St. Louis. They moved to Detroit, and from there they moved down to, to uh, Toledo. This is a picture of the Academy Club's roulette wheel in action. Uh, this was taken prior to a raid. Ran from 41 to 46. Again, let me go, I don't know why he's going backwards. Here's some of the matchbooks. And you'll see in the matchbook on the bottom left, uh, the horse is typically a code to let you know there's horse race betting there. And a number of the clubs used that same horse picture in their advertising, letting you know that there was horse racing and you could get the results of all sporting events. And this slide right here, you'll see they were so harmonious See the Jovial Club right yeah. here? Yeah. That's a different club by different owners. Yeah. They would advertise each other's clubs and they would give you free shuttle service back and forth between the various clubs. <coughs> and all the hotels. The Toledo Club's got a lot of clientele from Detroit. We're about 45 minutes from the Detroit airport and maybe about 50 minutes from Detroit proper. And they, they would have shuttles coming back and forth from Detroit. They called them fish wagons okay. to bring the fishes. Whales. Uh, you all know the term whales for the big fish. <coughs> what year was that, Terry? This one right here? Yeah, how do you the Decades. Decades. And it, it went on probably through the 60s, wow. uh, starting from the turn of the century. And somehow, Backwards. If I could only figure out why this mouse is going like it is. Previous. Where's previous? Oh, oh. Oh. One button's supposed to be forward and one button's supposed to be backwards, and it's not working that way. Jerry, you want to signal me now? Okay. Or not? Uh, sure. Here we go. Okay, the Bonaire Club. That was running about 10 years. And this is a very interesting club because it, it shows the ingenuity and the tenacity of the club owners. They were constantly getting raided. And typically the raids came when we would get a new police chief or a new mayor running on the ticket of I'm going to stop sin in the Toledo area whether it be prostitution or gambling. Uh, and the reason that it was, it was so interesting is that the way they got around being shut down, the police would come in to raid a club. They had to get through three doors. The three door situation was with many, many, many clubs. Remember, they all got together. They were communicating back and forth. And they realized that unless the police could catch them red handed gambling, they couldn't be arrested. So they would have three doors with buzzers. Some of them would have armed guards. They would have a perch up in the, the upper level. The police would come and they'd do a raid and they'd be banging on the doors, forcing it down, and they'd find another door. They'd break through that door, they'd find another door. By the time everybody got in, or the police got in, all the customers were in the back watching TV, I love Lucy. <laughs> Very frustrating. So what the police would end up doing is they'd arrest everybody for loitering. Oh. <laughs> so eventually the police and the city would close them down under the nuisance laws and they would padlock. Padlock orders would be for a one year period. The clubs were not gonna accept that and be shut down for a whole year. So what they would do is they'd either cut a hole in the side of the building and give themselves a new address because the orders were for the other address. Or 
they would build, quickly build on a new extension onto the side of the building, and that got a new address. And the Benor Club, you'll see, is building after building, extension after extension. Oh, there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> then they would change their name to the New Benor Club. <laughs> The super new Benora Club. But you can see that it has all the different extensions of, of the club. Yes, Keep running. This is about 1950. Here is uh, from 1957 when they did one of the raids. They shipped everybody outside. And you can see, there's another picture here of the parking lot. You can see the number of people that were doing it. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Bonaire Club was a very interesting place. It ran from 53 to late, uh, or 43, excuse me, to the late 40s. And uh, it was run by a guy named Jimmy Dugan. Uh, Jimmy Dugan took over for Joe Urbatus. And Urbatus was very famous for doing a million dollar post office robbery. Uh, that was in 1921. He was arrested, sent to the penitentiary, where he was given 60 years. Uh, from there, uh, the club, he was ended up being murdered. But uh, Big Edge and uh, Joe Arbatis ran the club. As I've been doing speaking games, people have been coming forward, the descendants of these club owners, and come to my speaking presentations with pictures of their parents and uncles, and having the book out has created a new wealth of information uh, that I could never even dream of. Uh, this became the Terminal Social Club when uh, Jimmy Dugan took over. It's now an Army-Navy store. This is a picture of the club in 1946. The, uh, the picture doesn't really do it justice. It's gigantic, this building. <laughs> The, uh, the upper levels were all residences for the club owners and management, the bottom level and the basement. There's actually a very big hill right here. These steps coming up here, I have a picture of the steps how they are now, is on a very big hill. It's a huge basement with like 10 foot ceilings. <coughs> this is the building as it is now. It's an Army Navy store. And if you look over to the left of the picture, there's that hill. And there should be one more picture. It may or may not be in here. It's not. But that picture shows just the steps going to a grassy area. And then on the far <coughs> right of the picture, you can see. But I can't do the entire book. You'll have to buy the book for all the good pictures. <laughs> uh, Benny Arnoff here ran the Buckeye Club, along with Firetop Sulkin. Firetop Sulkin was uh, Licavoli's right-hand man. And he's the one who brought Licavoli in. He really was just to keep the interests of the mob under a close eye. The Freddy brothers and Benny Arnoff, there was actually two brothers for the Arnoff. Benny Arnoff ended up coming out to Vegas and he bought a 50 cent, 50% 50 partnership in the El Rancho Vegas. And he shut them down when he realized the money was disappearing and the place was packed every night, but they were losing money. And he got Nevada Gaming Commission involved, and they were actually shut down. It was a, a very big uh, nightclub operation. They had all those top stars coming in, singing and dancing, and uh, he, he shut down the you old. Know. Yes? The Freddies were, the two Freddie brothers, they were involved in one of your other earlier songs. Many clubs. They had many clubs. Uh, same with the Arnops. And they would be partners with each other on various clubs. Oh, we went one to that clip also. Here's a Buckeye. This is during a raid. Uh, they did use both chips and silver dollars, depending on what period of time. They were running a long, long time. This is showing silver dollars. Next slide. And here's Al Shaw. The guy on the far left was one of the, uh, the important guys <coughs> in the uh, clubbing business. And Joe Arnoff, he's to the right. Uh, this is loading up silver dollars in a bag. Yep. Sorry, I did it. Tell me and I'll do it. Okay. okay. 
This is during one of the raids. The police are taking them out. Benny Aronoff is on the far right. Okay, next. Here's some of their matchbooks. The Buckeye Club chips, they had two, a one and a five. They had two different chips. Uh, Jim Myers found a interesting case. In the 30s, the heat was on downtown. They kept getting raided over and over, and they started moving the club to various <coughs> locations. They went out to Woodville Road, to uh, Ted Stone's Cafe, and they were running the gambling operations there. This is the beginning of the case. Wow. This is inside the case. Those are all the Buckeye Club chips. This is the top row of the Buckeye Club chips, or the, the case. There were some chips here, the yellow ones with the black inserts, they say junior. We have no idea where these junior chips came from. But the junior chips were also discovered with some chips that said uh, SJB. I don't know if any of you have seen a flower mold chip that says SJB. It was an unknown. It's not unknown anymore. It's been discovered that this stood for Samuel Joseph Vesessi. Vesessi brothers were five of them. They took over for Licavoli when Licavoli went to prison for four murder charges. Here's a picture of the junior chips. Three different ones. We don't know where they're from yet. Next. Chesterfield Club. It's a small club owned by Chalky Red. You see across from the Webster Inn, the, the uh, slide on the left, the Webster Inn was another gambling club. So they know that if you knew one club, you knew the other one, let me know it's right across the street. And again, a horse picture letting you know that there's race book there. Next. And that's a picture of the building. Coincidentally, uh, my first house when I was a youngster that I bought on my own was right down the street from that was two blocks away from this. When I first came to Toledo, I lived on Barrington Drive, and that was two blocks from Licavoli's house. <coughs> Only I didn't know about Licavoli when I was 10. <laughs> Club Devon, this is a fascinating place. Since the clubs were so successful in dodging the police and the raids, they all got together and said, let's get a really big Vegas type of casino. We want slot machines, we want a dozen or two blackjack and craps. And, and they, they all got together, and you'll see here under operated by Ben Arnoff, Buster Lepica, he was a mobster. Arnoff was not. Chalky Red, mobster. Tony Falk, mobster. Uh, Ed Warkin, not a mobster. But you see they had dice, they had roulette, they had horse, they had poker, they had blackjack, pinball, slot machines, chuck a luck, anything you can imagine, including carnival games like we have in Vegas now, they were there. It was the largest numbers of, of uh, illegal uh, gambling tables in the country. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, it shows you how many of each type. This was listed in the, the Toledo Blade and the Toledo News Me, listing out all of the types. Next slide. I have a question. Okay. Okay, so you call it Club Devon, mm -hmm. as opposed to, say, Club Devon? How, how, how do you know the pronunciation? I mean, is that tracked because out somewhere? I had breakfast with one of the old gangsters. I had breakfast with one of the Bassesis, and that's how he pronounced it. He's, I think, 96 now. Yeah. Uh, now, I shouldn't call him a mobster because he was the youngest of the brothers. He basically just worked at the place and he didn't have any mobster type things. Uh, so I, I got the pronunciation from him. Great, thank you. Here's showing you the lights of the club. They were right outside the city limits. So it wasn't a police issue, it was a sheriff's department issue. Uh, next slide. This shows you how big the building was. That whole building was the club. Next. The reason it came to a close was George Wilcox was a, a Detroit executive, and he lost $30,000 in the club. He got so mad, he wasn't just going to take the payback that the, 
people were the club owners were going to give them. They would give you a little pittance back. They probably have given them ten thousand, but uh, they would avoid it because or avoid it, the attention because they would be sued for gambling losses, and they would win a settlement. And they would go to court, they would sue so-and-so and the owner of the property for gambling losses. And they would get judgments. The newspaper is filled with different court suits for gambling losses at illegal clubs. <laughs> so he ended up writing letters to the mayor, to the governor, to the Toledo Blade, to the FBI, to all the club owners, every newspaper saying uh, that we need to shut down these elite clubs, they are going to be the downfall of civilization, and then he killed himself. So this is him. Next slide. This is uh, during the raids. The sheriff's department came in. They shut the place down. They're counting out money. They had no chips. At the time of the raid, they were they took $26,000 worth of silver dollars. Oh, wow. Nothing. That's a big operation. And those were the, the, the coins that were on the table. Here's some matchbook and dice. Now, what's interesting, again, is the matchbooks that were done for Club Devon and a number of the other ones, one side of the matchbook would be one gambling club, the other side of the matchbook would be another. The Club de Bon would also have on one side the Webster Inn, and they would, when one would get shut down, they'd move the extra tables to the other club. They were not the same owner, but they'd loan you. You need some craft tables? Sure, take these. I'm not using them right now. They all got along. Next slide. The Crescent Club. Now you see here the Purple Gang, Slash River Gang. Truly, it's the Lincoln Gang. But because in Toledo, I do the presentations, everyone knows them as the Purple Gang. Uh, he went right next door to the Joker Club, right next door. Uh, Licaholi was well known for his extortion practices. Uh, he originally got into the bootlegging business, and when he came to Toledo in 1931, it was the beginning of bodies being found all over the place. Many, many unsolved murders, but they were all uh, competition bootleggers and rum runners. And that was the beginning of literally bodies all over. It wasn't a week went by that there wasn't a body found. Uh, I was lucky enough to have access to some long lost missing files from the police department. During my research, I went into the Toledo Police Museum. It had only been open, I think, about six months. I went to the manager and I said, I'm doing this book, and I just wondered if he might have some information that could be useful. She said, Terry, this is your lucky day. I've got the missing files. I didn't know there were missing files. <coughs> I said, which missing files? She goes, well, the Lincoln Bowley files and all the, the mob files that have been missing, they were subpoenaed by other authors, but we didn't know where they were. And they were subpoenaed under the Freedom of Information Act, and they couldn't give the files. They didn't know where they were. They got put in a room, and then they were moved from this room to that room. The space is valuable in a small safety building. And then they just lost track of it. So they discovered these files. There was a few banker's boxes full, and nobody had actually looked through them yet. They hadn't been scanned. They were just old rice paper files, mug shots, and it was a treasure trove. There had been no mug shots released of Johnny Licavoli. The book that I have is the first released published pictures of his mug shots. There were pictures of various states' evidence that was used in his murder trial. Pictures of the guns and there was one after another. All the important files that I just couldn't find anywhere, even information, was all there in banker's box. I just walked in at the right place, at the right time. For some reason, they were really trusting. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, I said, I, I need to look at <coughs> these files, but they're not scanned. She said, well, I'll tell you what. If you come down to the safety building, I can let you look through a few of these. I said, I'd like to make scans go take my time and go through, can I see at the museum? Museums only open Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So, <coughs> she says, I'll tell you what, let me check on a few things, let me talk to the sergeant. There was a police substation right next door. Let me talk to the sergeant, see what I can do. I get a phone call back, the 
Terry, you can go over, talk to the sergeant, and he'll get you set up. And that's all I need. So I let them know at my office, I may not be coming in today. I go over there. He says, oh, sure. Takes me next door to the Toledo Police Museum, opens up, set recesses the alarms, clears them, takes me through the double, takes me in the back room. Okay, here's the files. If you're going to get out and leave the building for lunch, come and get me so I can lock everything up. And then he asked me, how, how many days am I going to be there? I go, um, I don't know. Depends on the file. Maybe all week. The museum's not open. They let me be there. I was there an entire week unsupervised, and I, I told her, you don't know me. I know me, I don't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> she, for some reason, thought that, you know, being a researcher, I would treat these pages. They were, there was rice paper letters back and forth. There's no internet back then. They would send a rice paper letter to Washington, to the Justice Department, to what information you have on so-and-so. Here's some fingerprints, see what you have for so-and-so. And there are signed letters from J. Edgar Hoover coming back. back. So there's all this communication. All the communication original on rice paper is still there. <laughs> original mug shots and, and the, uh, the ongoing criminal record sheets, all right there in these banker boxes. I, I thought I died and went to heaven. And they let me have access to them as much as I wanted to. They hadn't been scanned. So I, I obviously hit the mother load on that one, and I, I was able to get a lot of really important mugshots that are in the book that had never been seen before. Like, here's a picture of the Crescent Club on the left. The Jovial Club is on the right. Now, a lot of these places were known for their food. Here, if you can see the little sign said lunch. Okay. I like the date on the billboard. I oh, yeah, that. yeah, isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And there's a, a beautiful, uh, 1939 Chevrolet car up there. Next. Okay, the Dixie Inn was a big club. They had a lot of room on these chips, too. They had one of the few illegal places that had a set of roulette chips. I haven't discovered enough colors. I don't know if they only had a few colors or there's more. Uh, it was one of those things with illegals until it surfaces, and it could tomorrow. We just don't know exactly how many colors they had. Again, this was owned by the Arnott brothers. Marcy's. Uh, Marcy was was an assistant to Jimmy Hayes, who opened a number of clubs. And he was there at the, uh, the early 20s. They had craps, they had blackjack, they had roulette. Uh, and they were running around the clock. You wanted to gamble, you could go there at any time. And uh, 24 hours a day, you could, you could lay down a bed on the craps table. If the table was closed, you just wanted to play, they'll bring in a dealer any time, day or night. And here's a few pictures we're going to show that uh, of the, the Dixie at, at various places. They were open a long, long time. 22 years. Here's another one. This is an older picture. It's in the 50s. Next. This is their parking lot. Look at the number of cars that are lined up here in the parking lot. This is a big operation. And this was how it was the year that I wrote the book, which was 2012. Closed up, but still looks the same. This is inside, showing some of the crafts tables. Not the best quality picture, but this is what was in the newspaper. Next. Some of their various matchbooks. Now, if you look at the middle one, Dixie Inn Club is showing on one side. The Jovial Club, also known as the 631 Club, is on the other side. So there's another club, again, all back and forth, sharing their advertising. They probably split the cost. Uh, the, uh, the bottom of that center one shows you that the nationwide news on all sporting events. They were big on horse racing and sports betting, as well as all that is the table. <coughs> Here's some of their chips. The top three are the roulette chips. We have three colors that we know about. If you look at the, the middle row of the right side, it shows a $50 chip. Back in the 50s, $50 was a lot of money. They didn't have a $10 chip, a $25 chip. They just, as we know, there may have been more, but as of now, we, we don't know if there's any denomination that fits in the middle there. A $5 to a $50 is a pretty big jump. Are the uh, inserts actual inserts? Or are yes, they painted yes those are not painted, they're actual inserts. Sloppy. Next slide. 
This is what it is now. It's a huge recycling bin that runs, a recycling center that runs about a good mile down uh, Detroit Avenue. The El Rancho, an interesting club, they did not have a very long run. <laughs> Four days? Four days. Uh, the reason why is there was another club just right down the street called the Forest Park. And Forest Park decided when, when the El Rancho went in, we can't have this competition. Now this is later. Uh, so they said, we are going to put an end to this. And they made phone calls to the Sheriff's Department and posed as newspaper reporters. And said, hey, we're trying to track down this story. We heard that there's this big gambling club. Gave them the address. <laughs> police went down there and raided them. When the police started investigating, trying to find more information from these reporters for uh, the court, they found out there was no such people. They, they were fake names, and newspapers had never heard of these people. It didn't take much until the word got out exactly what happened. Uh, next slide. Here's a picture of the club. Nice operation. This is during the raid. $6,700 in silver dollars. They had downtown, they had a window that would tell you when the, when the shuttles would come by. And uh, it tells you the address. If you look at the, the left side, there's a notice below the clock. It shows you the different addresses where you could get the shuttle. Those are other various gambling clubs. It tells you on the right side. Now, this is painted on a window downtown. The odds that they pay for the different things. <laughs> Next. This is the horse race board, which show the results of all the different horse races. Okay. Crabs tables, silver dollars there are the white bags on the left side. Next. Then it became a dance club. The Jack Runyon Orchestra is a very famous big band orchestra in the Toledo area. Next. And they're down. They burn to the ground. Evergreen. They had a long run, but they were open, they were closed, they were open, they were closed. This next slide I'll show you their matchbooks. They originated downtown and they ended up moving out and moving to the suburbs. And here's the, uh, the dice. Next. That's the building they were in, they were upstairs. Next. The forest park, that, that's the, the uh, club that was right down the street that uh, called in to the sheriff's department. And if you see, it was owned by the Purple Gang, River Gang, Lickaholi Gang. They were raided a number of times, and uh, once they were shut down, they ended up becoming a roller rink. I ran into a man who collected slot machines in Toledo, and he had discovered a few things. One of them, he went, when, when the Forest Park closed, he went to their sale. They were selling all furniture and various things. And he had picked up some business cards that were laying in the parking lot nice. and had kept them all these years. Wow. I'm lucky enough to have one of these in my collection, but it's really rare to find a little teeny operation and find a business card from them. And the, the backside shows you directions from Detroit. <laughs> The Golden Rose, this was one of Licavoli's nightclubs that he extorted his way into. Uh, next slide. That's the club, it was a nightclub and, and dinner club on the first floor, gaming on the top floor. The police, like most cities that had gambling, were on the take. There was no way that you could have gambling operations funny running full force without having the police department, sheriff's departments, and detectives on the tape. Uh, some, of the, some of the areas in our town where there was a lot of prostitution, they used to call it the Tenderloin District. The reason they called it the Tenderloin District is because the cops were all on the take over there and they had enough money they could eat steak. Oh. So, with Licavoli, because he was, remember this is the same era as Al Capone, because of his extortion 
uh, going into the dry cleaning business, if you didn't take him on as a 50% partner, either your house could be shot up that night or your business burned to the ground. Uh, one of his uh, club owners, Chalky Red, who used to be a, a uh, rum runner, he had a pretty lucrative bootleg business, and when Licavoli came to town, he said, I want to be a partner, and I want 90%. And Chalky Red said, take a hike, I want no part of that. That night, his house was riddled with machine gun bullets, and the next morning, he has a new partner. Uh, so the police did not like Licavoli's tactics, and they understood these are gangsters and they want no part. And they did constant raids. Every time he'd take over a club, they would raid nonstop. And he couldn't really get going in the gambling business. The gambling was on the second floor. Uh, next slide. Hollywood Club. This is probably the most well-known of all the clubs. Uh, they went through a number of issues. Their chips were so well used that they had to bring out new chips three different times. There's three different issues. Actually, a fourth issue has a, a font difference, but uh, they were running for 20 some years. They had different locations, a uh, big operation, and they had all star reviews. They had comedians, they had burlesque, they had orchestras, they had dinners, they had dancing. It was one of those full-fledged nightclubs. Next slide. Okay. I ran into their grand opening, it's actually a grand reopening ad. And if you look down the center, I know that you can't see the details in this slide, but it shows you all the different big acts that are coming in. This is 1942. Next. Here's some of their chips. The green one on the top right was their first issue. I have not found a chip yet that is not well used. Never found a good condition chip. The one on the far left, that was the second issue. And there's actually a variation. That's the one with the black inserts. There's a variation in font uh, with a wider font version. The center one was the third issue. And it tells you how big the club is. They had a $25 chip. <coughs> that for us, I'm sure, is probably, what, $150 nowadays. Bottom showing some of their, their dice. Next slide. Terry, do you have all, all of the stuff that you're showing? Yes. Are they are your personal collection? Yes. Thanks. Uh, the top left, the man that gave me the business card, he was a slot machine collector, and he had purchased a couple of old slot machines that were in various clubs. One of the clubs it came from was the Hollywood Club. And the woman had told him there was some gambling club that her father was a part owner of. She didn't know where it was. When he opened up the machine, he found tokens that were from the Hollywood Club. It's really rare to find tokens from the Elite Club. This place was running so big and for so long, they had tokens made. You can see the top right shows the Hollywood Club token. Now, the, the tokens that are there, I don't have that many. He says he'll die with them. He did, he did sell me, I think it was about 12 and he sold. The rest, he said, I'm going to die with, I'm keeping them. Uh, that I guess he probably had, it was a, they were in a small coffee can, a one pound can of coffee, and probably about that high. So I'm guessing maybe uh, 100, 125. I've never seen them before, and I had no knowledge of them before I ran into this guy. I ran into, recently, some new Hollywood clip, Hollywood club chips that had never been seen before. And that's this bottom row here, in orange and in black. You go to the previous slide. I'm sorry, the previous. previous. You see the font and the way the layout is, the small key mold, these are exactly the same as these newly discovered chips forward. What the FBOC is, I have no idea. Perhaps the Freddy brothers, they were part owners, I, I just don't know. Hopefully, I'll, I'll get some information and we'll all be able to find out from someone, somewhere, someday. Uh, they showed up on eBay one day and I bid like crazy. Unfortunately, I was working out of town at the time and I didn't see them right away and a few sold off, uh, which is good. They got into the hands of hopefully someone that appreciates them. 
but I, I do have a few of these and they are available. Next slide. Here's some of their matchbooks. Cocktail Lounge. This is when they were in Superior Street before they ended up moving. So they're not really big. They're not, on, not out on Telegraph Road yet. So this is still when they were a smaller operation. Next. This is one of the raids that they had done. Those are a couple of police detectives that were just kind of vandalizing, taking the place apart, the crow, using a crowbar on some of the wood. Uh, the same day they did this, they did the Victory Club. They did a raid there and tore up their crap, craps tables and broke up the tables. Next slide. It then became uh, the headquarters for the Squadron One of the Civil Air Patrol, and the newspaper had a big ad, an article about how they're marching there and running through their drills. Now it's a Carter Plumbing, Electric, and Heating Company. Next. Okay. Jovial Club, that was right next to the, the Crescent Club. Uh, down on St. Clair, that's downtown. A lot of the clubs were on St. Clair, lined up across the street. And as they would do raids, they would close one address, they'd rent the store next door. If that one was raided, they put it across the street. <coughs> you always knew where to go for the gambling clubs, and if it wasn't here, it was there. It was 20 feet away. <coughs> you see the, the amount of time they were running from 1915 to 1937. Next. That's a picture of the place. And uh, like most places, they had a little cafeteria luncheonette on the main floor, and the gambling was upstairs. I have to just appreciate the architecture of this, yeah. this old building. It it's no longer there. Uh, modern day, you don't save cool looking buildings. You, you bulldoze them and you put either a nice parking lot or a stadium. You can't be bothered with fixing this stuff up. It's old. Yeah. Okay, next one. There's what, the match book. <laughs> Even though they had the name The Jovial, they still use the address a lot of these places did. Uh, the 631 Club, also the Jovial Lunch was their, their restaurant name. Next. Maumee Club, we're not really sure about this. Everybody's always thought this is from Toledo. I'm not convinced it's really from Toledo. The Maumee, actually, the river even goes into Fort Wayne, Indiana. It was recently a woman that had a number of chips on eBay, a 50 cent mommy and a five yellow five dollar chip in the mommy club. She got all these chips from her, her neighbor, I spoke with her, who said he got them from his father who used to own the club called the Old House in Fort Wayne. And the chips were from that club. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. I did some research. I have not found any reference to that club in Fort Wayne anywhere. Whether it is, I don't know. Now, I do know that a man named Edward Devlin had a club in Maumee with the blessing of a guy named uh, Whitey Bessessi. That Bessessi took over for the Gavoli when he went to prison. He stated in the article he ran this club and was shut down by the chief of police, Baggett, who shut them down in 1962. Uh, he's still alive. Uh, he's moved around. He was in prison for a big liquor heist that he had done when he got out of prison. Uh, he took off. His son, I've been in contact with him. His son is trying to find him. We don't know where he is. He, he was in Cleveland and he was in Pittsburgh, and we're still trying to track him down. We believe that he was, that, and this was in Maumee. Maumee's a very small suburb, a little township right outside of Toledo. And we believe that was the Maumee Club. I don't know for sure, and as information comes out, I'll bring it out. The chips in were always attributed to Toledo. I don't know if that's really true. So for me, it's been in the book, but the more I research, the more I can't find anything, the more I have to question. 
So right now, we're going to assume it really wasn't Toledo. The attribution that it was Purple Gang and Lincoln Bully, I, I don't know. I have not found anything to substantiate that. But I'll show you some of the chips. The chips that are came out in a little bit of quantity, they're not giant quantities, are the one on the top left and the top right. The $5 yellow and the 50 cent red. Next slide. The Pines Club, another Bassessi operation, along with the Freddies, Purple Gang, River Gang. This was actually a compound. There were a number of large, large residences. The building is still there. I've been inside the club. I've gotten to know Whitey Bassessi's daughter, uh, various relatives. I, there's one of the Bassessis who's still alive, Sam. And I was privileged enough and trusted enough to be allowed inside. Next slide. This is what the building looked like years ago. Next slide. This is what it looks like today. Nice. Next. Here's some of the memorabilia, the 50 cent chip on the top left, one dollar chip on the right. Again, the, the horse. Now this matchbook that's here, I just happened to run into at an antique mall. Look at the top side of the matchbook. It says the Victory Club, which was another one of Assessi's operations. When the Victory Club was raided and shut down, they started to bring the clientele to the Pines Club. If you look at the address listed, it's upside down, for the Victory Club, it's 2031 Alexis Road. It was never there. That's the address for the Pines Club. You can see on the bottom of where it says the Pines Club, 2031 Alexis Road. Victory Club was never there. Next slide. This is the inside. Look for the two yellow lights. They had giant yellow beacons on the side of the building. This is the place for gambling. <laughs> and it gives you points how to get there from Michigan. Next slide. This is the back of the building. It's a uh, five plus acre property in the middle of the city. Huge. And next to the building, this is the back, next to the building on the other side of the driveway is another big building. Uh, with what they call villas. Uh, and if you want to rent one, they're available for $800 a month. Uh -huh. And they're huge. I just saw a few weeks back uh, a for rent sign. And even now, you can live there. There are hidden compartments everywhere. If there's a built-in shelving unit in the hallway where you put knickknacks, it comes out. And there's a huge hidden area in the back with shelves and it's everywhere. There are hidden floor safes. There are false walls, false backs to closets. Uh -huh. Go to the next slide. Who owns the property? Bessessi's. Yes. This is the safe. I happened to just stumble upon them when they took me in. They had brought out into the garage the original safe. And not only is it a safe, but there's a safe within the safe. <laughs> there's Seven layers of solid steel for this safe. Go to the next slide, please. There's the safe within the safe. So again, with this place, I was just so blessed to be able to see some of this important historical type of information. It's just, it's just down. To me. Next slide. This is inside the club. Three doors. You can see the really teeny one. That's the very back door that's open. So you can see the three levels of doors. The ceiling that we see right here, this is the new addition. That was open. Above this ceiling, before it was closed in, there was a perch and a chair and a man with a shotgun. The door that's right here on the right, that was the stairs to get up to that perch. Now that was right at the final door. Uh, when you came in, the first level, women would have their purses checked, make sure there were no guns, men would be patted down. The reason they had the perch and the shotgun and the lookout was not for the police. It was to make sure that your customers weren't robbed. When you went there, they wanted to make sure you felt safe. Okay. 
The reason it was called the Pines Club is because everything was done in knotty pine. This is the cashier's window. Next. There's the kitchen. Look at the old tub. <laughs> Fantastic. Next slide. This is inside the club. It's used for storage, and then when they have parties, so they'll have uh, get-togethers, birthday parties, and get-togethers there. Uh, it's about 85 feet long by, I believe, 60 feet wide. Each one of those squares that you see on the floor are 10 inches wide. Next slide. <laughs> this is a cute slide. Uh, this is a man standing in a fake fireplace. Uh, in the next slide, I go where he is now and I take pictures. Oh. It was a big area where you could hide out and a floor safe. Not a real fireplace. That was one of the many hidden areas. This is two pictures of the same closet. The left side shows clothes hanging and just some wooden paneling. But there are some hooks there that are located right here and another one over here behind the hanger. They're just brass hooks right there. And when you grab the hooks, you can lift it out and up and remove a panel. And the panel is setting right here. Once I took the panel off, this opening is about five feet tall and probably close to three feet, two and a half feet across. Once you get inside, next slide, it opens up into a large room. Now this man is the, this was the lady you saw a minute ago. He can stand up in here, but there's an angled section here that were some, actually some steps. Uh, so he has not straightened up and he's still walking through. But you can fully stand up in here, probably six and a half feet tall. And this was just a strip of carpet. They were in the process of recarpeting. This over here is a lookout window that views out to the parking lot in that area. Uh, this was their count room. This is where they did handle all their money. Next slide. We're now on the next club is the Veterans Club. This, uh, this was again on the Detroit Avenue where the Webster was, where the Chesterfield was, the Dixie Inn, they were all in that same area. This is the same one. Uh, Al Shaw there, you, you see that name, that was the one I was talking about, it also worked for the Buckeye Club. I actually just finally got this chip that's on the right, was a missing chip that was needed for my collection, and I finally got it yesterday. So, hooray. Next slide. The Victory Club. Uh, this was Tom Moreland's place and Whitey Bassessi. This was the one that was uh, shut down and they were redirecting everybody to the Pines Club. Uh, interesting situation with Bloomberg, if you see Dave Bloomberg there. Uh, the club got some notoriety when Bloomberg just disappeared off the face of the earth. They didn't know whether he met foul play, but it was about Thanksgiving, and he disappeared, and his wife wanted to know where he was, he went to the police department, missing persons, and they started bringing all of the different club owners in to the police station and doing a big investigation. After New Year's, he suddenly surfaced, and called the police department and said, I had been kidnapped and I was held hostage all this time and I got by, they gave me a can of sardines once a day and during some closer investigations, he admitted, no, he really wasn't kidnapped, he was with his mistress the whole time for the holidays. <laughs> but he brought on a lot of heat onto the other club owners that were all marched in for investigation one by one. Okay, next. This is when they did the raid and they tore up a beautiful crash table. Heartbreaking. Next slide. Here's some of the memorabilia. The uh, 
They were known for their great barbecue. And people would come all over that just liked really good barbecue. They didn't go to the gambling club, but they went there for dinner. Next club. This is what it is now, it's just a carryout. New building, the old one had been torn down. Behind this is actually another building that they put up afterwards to try to get around the padlock orders. Next. I'm sorry, what's a rocket carryout? Uh, the rockets are the team for the university. That's all, the, the University of Toledo rockets. So that is right across the street from the beginning of the University of Toledo. Oh, thank you. The villa, this was an old place that was started by Jimmy Hayes. Jimmy Hayes was murdered, and uh, they were not able to pin it on Licavoli, but everyone knew it was him. You see, um, the other owner was Hank Manure Bloomberg. They gave nicknames to everyone, and somehow he ended up with the nickname Manure. I'm not so sure I'd like that nickname. Next. This is an old picture of the club. It was a fancy restaurant. Gambling was upstairs. It's still open to this day. Next slide. Here's what it is now. Angelo's Northwood Villa. Okay. The Webster Inn, another one of the big ones. Again, the two Arnott brothers and the two Freddy brothers. Uh, it was a big operation. They had matchbooks. Uh, no, no chips yet that I've discovered. There are some those. Next. They were, they were the one that closed down when Club Devon opened up in 1941. Devon opened, was running from 41 to 44. When they closed down, they got reopened into craft tables, got moved back and forth. This is their early days. This is uh, when they were in a house, big, big house. If you look at the bottom right, you'll see the back end of the 1920s car. Next. In the 40s, they were in a much, much bigger operation. Next. That's the entrance. There's, uh, at the beginning of the driveway, there's a security shack that was there. And uh, it was a pretty big building running full-fledged. Next. When they broke up their tables, the Toledo Newsbee was there to take pictures. Uh, you can see um, right here, leaning up against the table, is a chuckle Some of the places would switch back and forth on three various dice games. One was called Craps, one was called Bar Boot, and one was called Chuckle Luck. Chuckle Luck is in a cage, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. You rotate the cage and then the dice will be there, so no one had to actually touch it. Next slide. Now, that building is a junkyard. And the big property has got junk cars all over it, but it's still there. Next slide. Young Men's Social Club. This is another interesting. This was run by a guy named Pearl Barber. And Pearl Barber was a fascinating character. Uh, he was born about the time the Civil War ended. He was a light-skinned black man who was widely accepted into all the social circles and was beloved by everybody. He had a, a, an innate ability to befriend everybody and whoever met him loved him. And he was, he married a young blonde woman and nobody thought twice about it because they just loved this guy. Whatever charisma this man had uh, was able to have him transcend the racial barriers of the time. Uh, you see 1915, this is early on in the century. People were pretty bigoted back then. They weren't tolerant of other races, other religions. But yet with him, they loved him. And they allowed him to marry a, a white woman, blonde-haired white, it was unheard of. He bought a huge mansion on, on the river in a highly social area, and nobody minded. He, was, he would vacation in Europe, and he would pose as an East Indian man. He 
would have a walking stick, was dressed to the nines, he was polite, well-spoken, and everyone loved him. So he had a number of different clubs. He had the Young Men's Social Club. He was one of the men that figured out, I can get around the gambling laws if it's a private club. It's not open to the public. Gambling was allowed in your house. You wanted to make bets with your wife, your son, your kid, your neighbor. It wasn't a big deal. So he had a membership-only club. Next. This is an example of how well-loved he was. They didn't even put his name. They had people arrested. It was George Wilson that was charged with conducting the game. He didn't say he was an owner. But at the top, let me see if I can find where it was. Uh, there was another little line there. OK, next slide. We're going to get into some of the faces here. Uh, some of the mug shots that are here were never seen, had never seen in light of day, and I'm still discovering more. Uh, as we, we research some of those, oh, I have a little heckler here. Talking to me? You, talking to me. Hi, Ross. Uh, round of applause for my lovely assistant. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, next slide. Is Pearl Barber's picture on there? Yes, we'll, we'll get to him. He, uh, this is Benny Arnoff. He and his brother had uh, a number of clubs. And what I wanted to do, I, although I listed the names of the owners in the various clubs, now that we have the faces, we'll list out all the various clubs they own. You can see how many they were into. Uh, some operating at the same time, some back and forth. The Buckeye Club, the Benor Club, the Dixie and the Webster, Club Devon. It's a lot of places. And he ended up going out to Vegas for $500,000. He bought a 50% interest in the El Rancho Vegas. Uh, that did not work out. Next. Pearl Barber, this is the man we were just talking about. He had the Young Men's Social Club. Handsome man. He died. Uh, as a victim of a drunk driver. Mm. At the time, he was said to be the wealthiest black man in America. The Afro-American newspapers uh, had a hard time with the fact that all of his wealth was left to a white woman. And he did a little newspaper article about that. And I just thought it was kind of interesting that in this case, I remember how long ago it was, all the whites accepted him but the blacks had a hard time with the fact that all his wealth went to the white woman. Okay, next slide. What he was uh, Listing of those various clubs, the Pines Club, the Victory Club, the Benora Club. The Golf and Bowling Club was a neat one. Uh, there was no golf. There was no bowling. But they were called the Golf and Bowling Club. Where they put that club in was the second floor above a hat shop. And there was a poor guy that owned a hat shop that when they got raided, they only ran a short time in one year. They arrested Mr. Dovis and shut down his hat shop because of his gambling upstairs. Poor guy had nothing to do with the gambling. And he had to petition, they padlocked it under the nuisance laws and they were shutting him down. He was just a hatter. He was in the hat business, a poor guy was shut down for a year and a half trying to get this whole shop opened up again. And he had nothing, he rented it, rented it to the upstairs. He thought he was renting it to a, a group for a golf and bowling club. That was it. Poor guy got caught up in this bureaucracy. Okay, next slide. Pick Jim Dugan. There's the clubs he was involved in, the Bonaire, the Club Devon. Dukins, the Social Club, Social Club and Dukins and the Bonaire, they were really the same building. But when he took over it, it was the Bonaire, and it became Dukins and the Terminal Social Club. His real name, when I was researching, I could not find anything on this guy. And it was because it wasn't his name. His name wasn't Jim Dugan. It was Patrick James Dugan. And what I discovered, I, I spoke with one of his relatives, I discovered he had a patent for an interesting roulette wheel, a whole system with lights underneath, and it could deliver multiple balls at the same time. And what he did was he, he 
created this pinball-like machine to deliver the balls. You know how there's a little metal pole with a spring on a, a old pinball machine? You would pull it, release the balls, and it would shoot five balls out. There was no attendant that would shift the balls manually. Uh, it could be done with uh, different animals. So you could bet on, I want to bet on the horse, I want to bet on the pony, I want to bet on the rabbit or the ox. Uh, then you get one with different shapes and flowers, uh, as well as numbers. And in his system, it would light up if you got a certain column or a row or black 11, it would light up. That system has now been used at the Cosmopolitan Casino. If you go look at their roulette table and Dugan's uh, patent references is, are there on those references. Next slide. I got that picture from his daughter who contacted me, and uh, I was lucky enough to get a picture of him. The two Freddy brothers, a lot of club. The Nord Club, Club Devon, Pines Club, Victory, Westwood, Webster. They were big in the slot machines. That was the big bulk of their business was slot machines, and they owned the business that ran all the slot machines and had them everywhere in the city. For years, they were, there were slot machines running open. The police didn't pay attention. It was against the law. They were in restaurants. They were in pharmacies. They were in cigar stores. They were everywhere. And the Freddy's owned the business. Outside of the city limits, it was Tom Warland. Thanks. Benny Harris. He was involved in a number of clubs. He, he uh, did have craps. He had blackjack. Uh, but his main thing was sports book. Next. Jimmy Hayes, he was the one that was murdered up in Detroit. He went up to Detroit to, uh, for the opening game of the World Series. And that would be baseball, not the World Series of poker. Uh, and then he was uh, taken out by, uh, by the Bullies group. Next. Johnny Licavoli. This is the mugshot that I was talking about that had never been seen before that I got in the Toledo Police Museum. Long list of clubs that he was involved with, but his involvement wasn't necessarily real involvement. It was a matter of, I'm now a partner or else. Next, Chalky Red. Those are the clubs he was involved with. He was part of Licavoli's group. He was the one that they said we're going to be have 90% of your bootlegging business, and they shot up his house with a machine gun. Thanks. Those are some of the files that I got in the police department. There were three of those back in files. Thanks. So if you have anything to share, please contact me. I'm available. If you have pictures, information, or just want to say hi. Okay, that concludes it. Any questions? I'll open the floor up for anybody that might have a question. Did the French brothers die together? Because I noticed they both died in 58. No, they, they died just a few months apart, unrelated, uh, and it was just one of those things. But yeah, they, they did die the same year, but they were not together. Okay, thanks again, everybody. By the way, if anyone's interested in the book, I'm going to show this one. Uh, come see me. Thanks again.